Great. All right. Yeah, so this is, um, I really enjoyed these readings and it, it was very timely because uh, Sunday was Holy Trinity Sunday. <laughs> so. I forgot to thank you for the mercy you gave us by um, reciting the Nicene Creed instead of the Anathanation Creed. <laughs> the, the Anathema Creed, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's one creed, not three creeds. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... I like the Athanasian Creed, but it, it raises too many questions and concerns with people. And then you spend the whole Sunday trying to explain a creed. Well, then what hap then what ends up happening is that you, you're not really talking about the scripture. <laughs> so well, that's my rationale. For me, it's the length. Yeah, if you're getting frustrated with the length of a creed, that's probably not good. <laughs> Um, well, it seems redundant at the same time. Yeah, well, it's dealing with, you know, all these different heresies, so it had to restate things different ways. So, which um, is ironic because we're we really don't understand it anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh. C.S. Lewis is uh, introducing us into the three personal God. It's kind of his way of saying the triune God. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, the next three chapters are really kind of building on each other. Um, before I start talking more, is there anything that struck you about this reading? I like the way he uses simple terms <laughs> to build on each other to make up his um, description mm -hmm. of what God is yeah. as compared to what people think God is, which is, you know, very often two different things. Yeah. Yeah, I really find it helpful for him to kind of deconstruct what, yeah. what, when we, what we think about God. And he's not brutal about it, but he, I think he's helpful to, to remind us that sometimes what we grow up thinking is just our imagination. It's not uh, who God truly is. I found it kind of difficult to read. Like I had to reread passages over and over to try to understand actually what is being said. Yeah. <laughs> he actually encourages you to skip chapter three if 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 you get frustrated. <laughs> he said, just skip it. If it's not for you, just skip it. <laughs> mm. Knowing <laughs> as he does that the spirit knows what's going on. And when it's time for us mm -hmm. to be open to the ideas, mm -hmm. that's when, you know, they will come to us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's also good to remember that, and I don't know if he made this point, but, um, you know, the, the word Trinity, of course, is not a biblical word. Mm -hmm. um and if it you know if it was so important that people be able to define god or come up with some construction of, then i think the bible would have provided that so really when we talk about the trinity we have to acknowledge on some level that we'll never fully understand right mm -hmm. and, um and so how important is it that we understand? I would say probably not that important, but how important is it that we believe the truth of it? I think it's very important. And I think the truth of it is very simple to understand. It's just, uh, there's just no way to properly give a definition. And so a child could understand that they, you know, there's, that there's only one God and um, they can understand that we, that we experience God uh, 
through his creation uh, his, of us. We experience God through him sending his son, Jesus. And we experience God uh, through sanctification, through the Holy Spirit, you know, which is the catechetical way of explaining it um, and how Luther explains it. And um, I think children can easily grasp that, right? Well, it's an understanding of the ex of the experience of of knowing God, but it's not an understanding of of actually knowing Him personally, what His character is, or understanding that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's how we experience. God from our point of view. Yeah, yeah. Well, we tend, as he points out, to put God in the same kind of timeline mm -hmm. we're in. Yes. And he is pointing out that that's ridiculous yeah. because God obviously is not. I remember there was a thing that... Um, you know, one of these little wall plaques. Um, don't look for me yesterday. I was not yesterday. Mm. Don't look for me tomorrow. I will not be tomorrow. Look for me today. Mm -hmm. I am. And this is supposedly God speaking to people. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus says, um, I'm sorry, you, did you mute? No, go ahead. Oh, Jesus says uh, he actually um, violates the rules of grammar when he says, uh, before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, it, yeah, that God lives in the eternal now. Mm -hmm. And um, is that, the, I think that's the next chapter, though. So um, could we... Oh, and I think to Paul's point, too, that um, I think what C.S. Lewis is trying to draw us into is an intimate knowledge of God rather than a cerebral knowledge of God, you know, mm -hmm. intellectual, which is a dead end, right, to try to understand God intellectually. But to know him relationally is accessible, right? Mm -hmm. And again, even a child can love Jesus, you know, and we see that. At St. Luke, <laughs> yes, in such a powerful way. Uh, these little ones have a relationship with God that I would say often surpasses ours, right? Because we we pile adulthood <laughs> and um, and tend to um, cloud this cloud the glass. I love him talking about seeing. God through dirty glass rather yeah. than clean panes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like the way he talked about dimensions, you know. Yeah. That, that um that easy to understand what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. In God's dimension on page 162, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being. Just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Mm -hmm. huh. He talks on page 163. Uh, the thing that matters is being actually drawn into the three personal life. And that may begin any time. Tonight, if you like. <laughs> it reminds me of St. Paul when he's before King Agrippa. I think it's Agrippa. Or some, some king in the book of Acts. And the king says, basically, if you keep talking this way, 
um, you're going to make me a convert, <laughs> you know? And so that's what Paul wanted. And I think that's what C.S. Lewis wants. He wants people to, to come to this personal relationship with God tonight. <laughs> it doesn't have to wait. Today is the day of salvation, right? On page 163, I also, I thought it was a very powerful sentence at the bottom of the first yes. full paragraph. Um, he's talking about the threefold life of the three personal being. Um, is going on in the ordinary little bedroom where an ordinary man or woman is saying his or her prayers. The person is being caught up into the higher kinds of life, what I called Zoe, or spiritual life. He is being pulled into God, by God, while still remaining themselves, him or herself. I thought that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about prayer like that, where God is drawing you to himself and you're becoming one with God? And yet, remaining yourself. <clears throat> that could be as confusing as, as trying to uh, understand the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of theologians will compare <clears throat> the marital union between a husband and wife to also be mm -hmm. a similar mystery, right? Where the two become one. And um, and yet they still remain uh, themselves, but they are on a different, in a different way, or also one. <clears throat> St. Paul calls it, you know, a mystery, actually, in Ephesians 5. Well, I think the last paragraph on page 163 mm -hmm. is the one that pulls it all together and describes exactly how, you know, it became a theological description of mm -hmm. God. Because um, that's how theology started. <clears throat> yeah. People already knew about God in a vague way. Mm -hmm. But then came a man who claimed to be God. Mm -hmm. And yet he was not the sort of man you could dismiss as a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> they made him. He made them believe him. They met him again after he had been, they had seen him killed. Mm -hmm. And then when they had been formed into a little society or community, mm -hmm. they found God somehow inside them as yeah. well. Directing them, making them able to do things they could not do before. Mm -hmm. And when they worked it all out, they found that they had arrived at the Christian definition of the three personal God. Mm -hmm. And of course, Trinity is just a description of that. Right. It's not, um, you know, a word that came out of the Bible other than descriptively. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you know when the word Trinity was first used? Was that just when they were crafting the creeds? Um, I think it was um, in response to the Arian controversy. So I think it was, um, I, I think it may have been 
third century. I, I'm not sure. Uh, it, maybe you could Google that because <laughs> I don't remember. The Arian controversy was a little later too. I think that was in fifth century, but I'm not sure. Um, that's a good question. I probably read about it once, but <laughs> it slipped out of my mind. Um, uh, it's interesting, um, the passage you read, Janet, that not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, we're going to have a reading from Mark where the people say of Jesus, he has gone out of his mind, right? Mm -hmm. And his, his, his mother and his brothers are looking for him. And so um, there were people who thought he was nuts, uh, you know, at various times or had a demon, which is also in the same passage. Um, but I think if you take the Gospels as a whole, it's I think it's very clear that you couldn't easily dismiss him as a lunatic. <laughs> Especially Microsoft's AI co-pilot says that the term Trinity was first introduced by Tertullian around the end of the second century. Second century, okay. Thank you. One thing AI is good for. <laughs> <laughs> that rings true, AI. Thank you. Um. It's, yeah, it's 20 after, so we can go to the next chapter, Time and Beyond Time. Um, of course, I'm a total nerd, so I really love this passage, this this chapter. Um, if you've read any of other, any other of C.S. Lewis's books, like The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, this, this, he plays around with time, too, so when Lucy goes into the closet to hide and she ends up being in Narnia, right? Am I speaking, have you guys read that book? Or you know yeah. that story? Yeah. So when he goes, when she goes into the the wardrobe, she ends up in Narnia. She thinks she's there for like a whole day, right? But when she comes back into the wardrobe, and her her siblings find her because they're playing hide and seek. She's like, "Were you looking for me? You know, how long have you been looking for me?" And they're like, "We just we just started playing." <laughs> and so in our world, just seconds went by, but in Narnia, uh, hours went by. And and then you at the end of the book, uh, the the three go back. Uh, to basically they go back they spend a whole lifetime in Narnia but when they go back um it's only been like an hour <laughs> that they've been gone so it's really it's really interesting this is many ways that C.S. Lewis plays with time and I think it's really good because I think when we look at especially Jesus um and we look at him uh during his earthly ministry and then after the resurrection and the appearances in the books of book of Acts, and then we we start to understand that that Christ was showing up in the Old Testament, and so uh, like I I on Sunday I I preached Isaiah six, and I at one point in my sermon I I referred to Isaiah seeing Christ right, and I and that's I think we can make those claims. If we have an understanding of how how God transcends time, and that you know he, Isaiah could not have seen God and lived, it would be impossible. So how how is that possible that he said, said he saw God? Because I think he saw Christ. He saw Jesus. So, um, and I think it. Um, Another thing I wanted to say about this was that uh, in Chicago, there was an art exhibit at the Art Academy Museum. And uh, it was called Prayer. And uh, I participated in this project. He did recordings of 
prayers from all different religions. So he chose, he actually chose too many Lutheran churches. So I ended, they ended up not using us. Uh, but it was, it was a, a big red carpet in the middle of a, uh, a large room. And he had speakers on the floor. And in order to hear what was coming out of the speaker, you actually had to kneel down or sit down and get close to the speaker. And there were recordings of people praying in different languages from different traditions. And um, there was about 30 speakers on the floor. So you had a number of people kneeling or sitting on this carpet, listening to different prayers. And uh, it was very striking because it was very, it, it sounded like a cacophony, right, of prayers. Pentecost. <laughs> yeah, it was like Pentecost. So you had all these different languages, all these different traditions. And yet, it, what struck me was that God isn't confused. God can hear all those prayers at the same time. And I think C.S. Lewis, is, his point is that for us, that would be an obstacle, right? To, to hear it all at the same time. But for God, there is no obstacle because he lives outside of time. So for him, he's living infinitely into each prayer. <laughs> he's got, he, each prayer has our infinite, he has, it has his infinite attention. It's just, it just blows the mind. I liked his description of the writer who, when they reach a point where they're not sure or they got to the semicolon in the paragraph, deciding to get up and have a cup of tea, take a walk around the block, mm -hmm. do something else for a couple of hours. Yeah. And then come back and have in mind exactly how to end the sentence. Yeah. That that does not show to the person reading the novel. <laughs> yeah. That he took that kind of time. Mm -hmm. We can't see what kind of time God takes and how he decides to spend that time. Yeah. He simply is, and he knows. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Page 167, uh, he says, God has all eternity. This is at the, 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 the bottom of the page. He has all eternity in which to listen to the split second of prayer put up by a pilot as his plane crashes in flames. Of course, this again, this is written during World War II. And so for that would bring comfort to me if I knew I lost a loved one, right? Um, that in that split second of prayer that God heard. And well, that's why we should have less uh, disdain for deathbed confessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so many people will say, oh, yeah, they, you know, this is fire insurance or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, that's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen it myself in ministry, how God draws people sometimes late, you know, and um, my dad was like that. It wasn't a deathbed conversion, but he did have a stroke and almost died. He did, he was be flatlined for a while when he was about 70. And, um, but then he, you know, faith was not important to him after that, uh, before that. But then after that, he was eager to go to church and 
he talked about his faith and it's amazing. Um, and I've seen it with people where they've in the last hours of their life turned to Christ. And we shouldn't despise that because um, in a way it's their loss that they didn't have that earlier. But it's but God is so gracious and merciful that it's not going to be an eternal loss, right? <clears throat> and it, and really, what is, aren't we being pharisaical if we feel like we've been more faithful or, uh, or we're better? I mean, that's not at all the kind of attitude that God wants us to have. As you point out, luckier mm -hmm. simply because we've had it longer yeah uh often through our own devices simply right. because we were in the right place at the right time yeah Page i remember was... when osama yeah. bin laden was killed yeah. And there was a lot of rejoicing going on. And my yeah. sister made the point that it was actually a tragedy because he was not given the opportunity to hear the gospel. That we know of. That we know of. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, anyone who who dies and did not have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, is a tragedy because then they're likely not to be with God and yeah. Christ. Uh, page 168, right in the middle. Um, this struck me when I was 20 years old. I remember this sentence. When Christ died, he died for you individually, just as much if you had been the only person in the world. That just, it just struck me so much to think about that, 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 and that we're talking about the infinite love of God, right? The infinite love of Christ that, um, and it has to be true. That if we were alone in the world, um, God would still, he wouldn't, he wouldn't love us any less, right? Just as there are eight, what, eight billion people now. Uh, I used this in a sermon not too long ago that, you know, and I, I got this from, another preacher that you know what is half of a what is half of infinity <laughs> it's infinity right what's one eight billionth of infinity infinity <laughs> it's like 50 percent kosher yeah <laughs> we had uh, a pastor at one time preach on uh use that exact uh, concept when he was preaching on Luke 2 that Christ would still have come if you were the only one there. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm wondering, did he get that from this? From C.S. Lewis? Yeah. Yeah. He may have, yeah. Um, the other line I liked a lot on the bottom of page 168, second to last paragraph. If you picture time as a straight line along which we have to travel, then you must picture God as the whole page on which the line is drawn. <laughs> and now with- Except with, the page doesn't end. Right, exactly. And you know, now, now, uh, theoretical physicists surmise that um, the, inf the the universe likely is finite, right? And that there there is a reality outside of space and time. So, and we would call that God, right? Where that's where God uh, 
dwells. But he not only exists outside of time and space, he also exists, he is in, he incarnates, right? He becomes part of our humanity. He becomes part of creation in Jesus, which is just astounding to think about, that he's both. And um, he says, you cannot fit Christ's earthly life into Palestine into any time relations with his life as God beyond all space and time. That's on page 169. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is kind of a mind bending chapter, I guess, but. Uh, I think really helpful. I was thinking about uh, Revelation. Uh, based on a revelation, there is going to be a, an end right. to, as, as we see it now. Right, yeah. Or to put it another way, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, right? There'll be yes, a beginning. Yes, yes. A, a, new, a, a, a restart. <laughs> Renewal. Um, I was also struck, and I'm not sure I totally understand this, but at the bottom of page 169, he says, God has no history. He is too completely and utterly real to have one. I think what he's saying is that we can't reduce God to just being part of the past, right? I think maybe that's what he's saying, but that god eternally is you know like jesus says i am the alpha and the omega the one who is who was and is to come so we can't just reduce him to was <clears throat> you guys feel like you're in seminary class but <laughs> As much as you can't put Christ, Christ's eternity into time, Christ's life is the rope that we get from God's eternity. And I'm saying God and, and Trinity um, for us, mm -hmm. where we need that umbilical in into our time mm -hmm. to grasp his nature and his salvation. Mm -hmm. He's the lifeline to eternity. Yeah. In him we live, move, and have our being. Right. Paul repeats that several times in his writings. He's the author and sustainer of our faith. The writer of Hebrews, I think. Do we want to go to the chapter Good Infection? It's on page 172. I kind of chuckled when I saw the title, and then you don't really understand the title till the very end. <laughs> um, I actually, right over here, if you look over on my shelf, I've got books stacked on each other. I've got three books stacked here. So he, he starts off with that analogy, you know, just to imagine those books having been stacked there from eternity's past. In other words, no one put the first book down first and then the second and the third, but that the books uh, have always been in that order. And so the book on the bottom is holding up the book on top uh, for eternity. And so I thought that was a really 
And I'm I'm also intrigued that you know he 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 said there's a I think it's a really interesting way of explaining the relationship between the God the Father and God the Son, and it's interesting that he doesn't add the Holy Spirit to that that he only used two books not three. And do you want to guess? I mean, I have a guess why he didn't do that. Do you do you guys have a guess? So he's talking. His book is Mere Christianity, so he doesn't want to divide denominations. Um, the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't believe that the the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. So if you were to add the third book or the Holy Spirit to that analogy, he would lose his Eastern Orthodox Christians. So I think he's very wise to to leave that out. But anyway. That's a that's a, a theological. I was gonna. I was thinking maybe you know the Holy Spirit is all around. He was. Mm -hmm. He was. Yeah. I he think was there true. all the time. <laughs> I I think it's true. Yeah. He's the bookshelf. There's Ro and Andy. Hi, I'm. I made it just for the end. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's good. We just started chapter four on page one seventy two. My good. good infection. Okay. Figured I'd catch the last 20 minutes of it. We're glad you guys showed up. I just got home. Okay, chapter four. We were talking about that analogy of the books being stacked on each other. Um, So if the Greek Orthodox reject the proceeding, the Holy Spirit as proceeding from the Son, where do they see the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity then? Well, they, okay, the controversy is called the Filioque controversy, F I L. F I L I O Q Q U E. Yeah. It's one word. It means and the Son. So they, okay, in the Creed, we say he, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, they, they, they supposedly divided the church, this one little word, but that's a longer discussion. Wow. But they believe he, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Oh, okay. Yeah. And but so, the father is the son. Well, <laughs> that's where the whole controversy, you know, like my history professor said that this whole debate was like, it was like a, a couple that has marital, really terrible marital problems, right? And then they end up finally getting a divorce because they can't agree on the color of the carpet, right? Um, it wasn't the color of the carpet that ruined their marriage. It was because they had a bad marriage. <laughs> and um, and so that that's how he describes this whole controversy. It's 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 kind of the the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. No. But um, but I think that um, I think the reason why C.S. Lewis is focusing on the sun here is because that's where we draw our identity right where we become one with with god through christ and of course the holy spirit is integrally and in, in, integral in that um uh, um i was very intrigued <laughs> on page 174 where he talks about god is love it's on the yeah. Um, and that we couldn't say that if he wasn't a triune God. I thought that would, I've never heard that argument, but it really rings true, you know, because the father loves the son, mm -hmm. the son loves the father and the Holy Spirit loves, they all, and he describes it as a dance on page 175. Um, mm -hmm.
And that's why 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the greatest of these is love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's what you end up with when faith and hope have lived out their purpose. Yeah. And what are the great commands, right? What's the greatest commandment? One, love nine. your neighbor as yourself. Love God first. Yeah. To love God, yeah, with all your heart, mind, so soul, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, so the great command is, yeah, is love. love, but it also is the great reality. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, because if God was just a supreme being that existed alone before the creation, mm -hmm. we could describe him as lonely, right? That yeah, he was alone. Well, that's just ridiculous, right? And so I think to think of God not as a supreme being, but rather as a three-personal God, a triune God, then we can see that that love is eternal. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's so beautiful. I I had never thought of it that way. I think when I was 20 years old and read this, I think that probably just went over my head. And we just had that in our scripture readings from First John, that God is love. Right. It's not a sentimental thing, right, when you say that. Yes, the last paragraph on 174, mm -hmm. where as you know, to say God is love, what they really mean is love is god yeah they really mean our feelings of love however and wherever they arise mm -hmm. you know are different from what you know but that's different from what christians mean yeah Um, there's a, a book I read a, a few months ago that says we shouldn't use the word exist with God. We should use the word is, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting um, that we, if we say exist, it has the, the, the notion of being static or just kind of real, whereas mm -hmm. is, is, is just, um, it's it's beyond that right it's yeah and take in the universe <laughs> say that Where, again janet i said it can take in the entire universe yeah, yeah where exactly. it exists almost wants to pick a timeline and put them in a specific place you know yeah uh, our our idea of Christ very often as just the 33 years he was here, forgetting that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. I, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, as, as we have progressed from our history going way back where uh, everything revolved around the earth and now we're just a, a spot in a vast universe and, uh, and, and they're finding all things out about the human body that, that uh, you know, when I was a kid, we had like 90 uh, uh, elements. Now there's over a hundred elements and, you know, it just keeps going on and on. Yep. It's dynamic, right? It's not static. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
on page 176 um, at the very top. In the Christian life, you are not usually looking at him. He is always acting through you. If you think of the Father as something out there in front of you and the Son as something standing at your side, helping you to pray, trying to turn you into another son, then you have to think of the third person, the Trinity, as something inside you or behind you. Just mm -hmm. And I think what he's trying to do is show us this multi-dimensional reality of, of God and why it's necessary to think of him as Trinity because if we think of him as a, as a singularity, right, as just, then we run into all these problems. So this is really meant to open us up to kind of live in wonder, right, and to marvel at God, which I think is faith. I think, I think when we when we realize our, the limitations of our minds, and we um, we're kind of awestruck by God. I think that's faith. Because we, we we realize he's trustworthy and and we can't rely on ourselves. We have to depend on him. It's humbling, but it's it lifts us up at the same time. And he invites us to take our place in that dance. He says, on the in the middle of page 176. On the bottom of page 176, once a person is united to God, how could they not live forever? Once a person is separated from God, what can they do but wither and die? And then he asks at the top of page 177, how is it possible for us to be taken into or be united to the three personal life? And that's how he ends with Christ infecting <laughs> us <laughs> and that he came to infect us with his life and he calls us a little Christs which by the way you know where that comes from Lutherans <laughs> Luther Martin Luther said that he said that we become little Christs So I don't know if C.S. Lewis gives Luther the credit, but that he is definitely quoting him. Pastor, so once a man is separated from God, what can he do but wither and die? I mean, at the judgment day, mm -hmm. those who don't believe are going to be sent to hell but they don't die nothing in the bible shows uh, my interpretation i don't, I don't think, think he's talking about hell no I, I think he's thinking about the parable of the the vine and the branches okay okay yeah mm -hmm. and, okay um, and, and i know that to be true because c.s lewis has a very nuanced view of hell like like i do you know and so he would never he would never talk about people going to hell in the in the Dante Inferno sort of way. Yeah, so I think I think what he's talking about is that our life is in Christ. And so when we withdraw from that, or we don't abide in Christ, to use Jesus' words, yeah, we wither and die spiritually, right? 
Um, so similar parables to what happened to Jonah, where you got allowed a I don't know yeah. big tree, but there was another one where Jesus is walking along and he cursed the fig tree because it didn't have any food in it with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the kind yeah. of the parable there to me is saying that okay, if you don't want to belong to me, then this is what will happen to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's 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 a it's what Luther in his hymn, one of his hymns, calls a living hell, right? And so when we withdraw or we're trying to live outside of our life in Christ, whether it's sin or unbelief or whatever it is, um, our life becomes a living hell. That's what the hymn says, you know. And so, and usually I think, I think what, what Jesus is usually most concerned with is what our, what our current state is now, right? What our, what our spiritual state is now, right? And so I think in, I think sometimes we make hell out to be this future punishment sort of thing. And I think that, and it's not to deny that, um, although, like I said, I have a very nuanced view of that. But rather, the emphasis is on where are you now, right? Where is your heart now? And and so, like in the parable of the, the the rich man and Lazarus, it's the same emphasis, right? Go tell my brothers so that so they can be warned about this. And what does Jesus say through Abraham? They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them, <laughs> right? <clears throat> And I, but I love this idea that 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 we are to become little Christs, and that's what what do we call ourselves Christians, right? That's what that means, mm -hmm. and so we are also anointed anointed with the Holy Spirit, and we are also called to become like Christ, right? And to allow the life of Christ to live through us, um, even if you give a cold glass of water to somebody in Jesus' name, right? You've loved Christ, right? Jesus mm -hmm. says. <clears throat> oh, faith like little children. Exactly, yeah. Any other thoughts? It certainly gives you a reason for the fact that you can listen to the same scripture many times. Yeah. All of a sudden, on one specific day, you hear that particular thing, and it changes your whole outlook on it. And, you know, you find yourself thinking, well, I've heard that before. How come? And that's how it come. The yeah. spirit there. Well, yeah. He, he yeah. helps us, yeah. In our weakness and and at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And like C.S. Lewis is saying, we're we are not do we're not doing it, right? Christ is doing it through us, right? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is around and before and behind and the father is you know transcends it all and also yeah so it's yes that she had a lot of funerals like <clears throat> very close people to her she i i i heard a preacher say recently and i really agreed with this mm -hmm. that that we could you could probably listen to a lot of and i i, I I guess you could, I would, I think you can include myself. You could hear a lot of preaching that's not tri, Trinitarian, right? And that, that, that we need to bring this understanding of God back into our preaching, into our prayers. And mm -hmm. because it, it, beca it makes it so much more dynamic, you know, um, 
and uh, we we slip into this view of God as like Zeus, you know, with his thunderbolt <laughs> on his throne. But that's not God, right? God is love. Right. God is just as just. I mean, just and fair. Yeah. And sometimes that can be interpreted, you know, maybe as being mean or angry, but he's just. He's 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 the eternal good. Yeah. Okay. So he has a standard that you know has to be lived up to. Mm -hmm. So for uh, next week, um, can we do chapters five through seven? So it'd be page 178 through page 194. That's 16 pages. I, I think we can do that. And then I think we're going to be maybe a week or two oh, after that away from finishing the book. So. Um, should we close in prayer and pastor could i ask you one question very yeah. quickly someone i watch a lot of bible stories and bible evangelicals on television and wanted to mention that the trinity was never mentioned in the old testament is that true i didn't get a chance to look at that it's not true it's not true you can infer it you can infer it but it's not, it's, it's the same with the New Testament. Even Jesus says to go baptize in the name of the Father, you know, teach in the baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you have the three together. But you have, in Genesis 1, you have the three together too. You have, okay. you have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then you have the spoken word, which John tells us is Christ. Right, yeah. And then you have the spirit that's hovering above the Open water. Water. So yes, there. yes, yes, okay. Um, you have it. In uh, last Sunday, in my sermon, I, I talked about this holy, holy, holy. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, you have a number of passages that infer it, but it's it's never explicit in the Bible anyway. Yeah, that's what they probably meant because that was confusing to me because yeah. I that was not like I just said not a direct reference to. Yeah. But kind of an indirect inference in there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just one thing before we leave to everyone who was saying prayers for baby Owen. Mm -hmm. Baby Owen came home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He made it. He's been home a couple of weeks now and he's doing great. So yeah. the family Thank thanks you. you for all the yeah. prayers. Nice. Oh, terrific. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this day, our, our study, and that you are the God of wonders and uh, that you are the God who's our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer as the triune God. We're thankful for um, baby Owen's recovery and that he's at home. We pray to continue to strengthen him, that you continue to be with all of us this week and uh, enliven our hearts, help us to join this dance of the Trinity and, and to become more like Jesus. And uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. See you next Bye. week. Bye.